Well, hello and a very warm welcome along to Real Israel, where we're here with the uh, very latest in our series of special interviews. Uh, we've already met some very interesting people, most recently uh, Nazi hunter Dr. Ephraim Zurov and the chairman of World Likud, Danny Danon. Now, today I'm delighted to say that joining us is Richard Pater, who is director of BICOM in Israel, uh, BICOM being the British Israel Communications and uh, Research Center. Now, Richard has over 15 years experience working alongside government officials, diplomats, and the likes of myself, uh, journalists, and he's responsible for the delegations of BICOM that they bring to Israel. He's uh, formerly worked at the Israeli Prime Minister's office, and he received the Prime Minister's Prize for Excellence. And he served in the IDF Armour Brigade and still serves uh, in the reserves. So, Richard, uh, quite an impressive CV you bring to the table, and it's lovely to have you with us here today. Thank you, Paul. It's great to, great to join you today. Well, we're here to talk about the elections, um, the latest uh, elections that were um, going through here in Israel. But just before we come to discuss um, the matter at hand, I wonder if you could just explain to viewers that aren't familiar with BICOM what exactly you're all about, what you stand for, and uh, what you're hoping to achieve. Of course. So BICOM, as you said, is Britain, Israel Communications and Research Centre. We basically work on the axis between, between Britain and Israel to provide information analysis and as a resource on anything related to Israel for a UK uh, policy orientated audience. And we focus our research on four main areas on domestic Israeli politics that we'll soon discuss on Israeli Palestinian affairs on Israel and the strategic uh, regional issues and an emphasis on the bilateral relationship as well, which we look to promote. And just um, before we get to the election thing, with regard to the situation with coronavirus, um, how has that affected the uh, the traffic of uh, business and interest between Israel and Britain? Has have things been put on hold or have things been bubbling along under the surface quite nicely? Well, I think like lots of organizations, we transitioned. We used to, as you mentioned in the introduction, we used to bring um, delegations, mostly of senior journalists, to Israel because from our perspective, there's no better way to really understand what's going on here than to see it for oneself. Um, obviously, for the last year, we haven't been able to do any of these trips. So like a lot of people, we've reverted to Zoom um, to, uh, to, to, as a replacement. But we look forward, hopefully, later in 2021 to renew our visits here to Israel. So there's been some very interesting uh, aspects and some uh, ways of being able to overcome uh, the difficulties we've seen um, during COVID. And that, that's very good to hear. But of course, what we're really here to talk about today, Richard, and using your expertise uh, to guide us through what is quite a maze, uh, which is the Israeli uh, political scene. And um, in particular, the fourth general election, which is coming up next week. Now, uh, let's just um, go to the first point, Rich, really, which is why on earth are we having a fourth election in two years? What has brought us to this point? Well, I think it's clear for most people here in Israel that the, the only reason we're going to the elections is as, is as a result of a political manoeuvre by Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, twofold. One is an attempt to, uh, to, in the context of the corruption charges that he faces, and in the framework of the uh, original coalition agreement that was made last year, that this was the last exit point he could do and remain as interim prime minister. So the, uh, the, the process that came about was basically that the government failed to pass a budget, so the, uh, the Knesset was automatically disbanded, but the background is his corruption case and the, and the deal that he was able to expose this loophole. So for those that uh, his critics that suggest that he's holding the country to hostage in order to uh, try and stave off the uh, corruption trial, do you think there's some mileage in in that particular allegation? I, th I think so. I think it's I, I, I mean, I think it sounds quite, quite reasonable. As I said, I mean, my position, I'm going to try and be uh, be unbiased and kind of give a give a give a broad overview of the political spectrum. But in terms of why we're going to the election, it seems quite clear. I would say that in defense of Netanyahu, what he would perhaps argue is that from the beginning, when they built the, uh, the, the arrangement of the coalition government, this was a national unity government built up in the context of the crisis when the coronavirus was just beginning, they felt 
that even though this was a parity government, the deal was already skewed against Netanyahu and his and his, and his bloc because they came with so many more seats than the Blue and White Party that, that disintegrated upon signing that agreement. So from their view, the whole agreement was out of sync and, and unbalanced and therefore unfair. Yeah, indeed. And uh, just uh, looking at the situation, people that may not be... Um au fait with all the uh, different intricacies of the Israeli political scene is that we, we were in a position of having a, a rotational prime ministership um, and the negotiations were concluded in with Benjamin Netanyahu taking the first turn and Benny Gantz, who uh, was uh, representing the blue and white, to take the second uh, turn. Now, a lot of people, uh, when this um, was uh, decided, said straight away, well, Benjamin Netanyahu is such a brilliant politician and tactician that surely uh, when his turn has finished, he's going to find a way not to see Benny Gantz uh, have his turn as well. Do you think from your perspective, having seen so much in Israel and the politics, that Benny Gantz might have been a shade naive in agreeing to take the second turn uh, of the premiership? I think in, in hindsight, yes, one could, one could make that case. Um, but bear in mind... We'd gone through uh, two elections already that had produced a stalemate. This was the third. And and there were opportunities earlier to have joined the government. But really, the coronavirus and the implications, both as a health and economic crisis, was the catalyst to, uh, to produce this national unity government. And because of the overall size and strength of the Likud, as opposed to blue and white, it necessitated that Netanyahu wouldn't counter anything but he's going first and leading. What's interesting, by the way, is if you the last time there was some form of national unity government back in the 1980s, the lessons that was learned from that was it was actually more beneficial to go second because that was the way you could be the incumbent fighting the next election. This was, of course, the grand, the grand bargain between the Likud and the Labour Party. But, and, and so it actually worked in, in uh, Prime Minister Shamir's uh, advantage to go second. But clearly this was not the case because they weren't dealing with such a wily and, as you say, kind of tactically uh, smart politician like, like Netanyahu. Well, there's, there's no two ways about it, whether you support him or whether you don't. Benjamin Netanyahu is a, a quite brilliant politician and tactician, as you, you've pointed out, whereas Benny Gantz appears to have um, been uh, perceived as uh, naive. He also um, went back on his promise, didn't he, that he would never sit in any government with Netanyahu, which was why his party achieved so many votes and why it has split. Now, just as far as Benny Gantz is concerned, he's running on his own as blue and white. Do you think he has any chance of uh, achieving enough votes to pass the uh, minimum threshold this time? I think it's going to be very close. I mean, he's, his party, along with, with two or three other parties, are going to be very close to the, uh, to the threshold. And in broad terms, unlike the last two or three elections where we've had these large two blocks of Likud and blue and white um, determining the outcome, this election could be very much be determined on the, uh, on the fringes around those small parties. But I'll just say a couple of things, if I may, in defence of Benny Gantz, because I think he is being criticised largely for his naivety. But I think in his term, and history may judge him slightly different, two important points during the duration of 2020 while he was in the government. First of all, he was able to, uh, to hold for himself and his party three of the most important positions within the cabinet. He himself was the defence minister, Ashkenazi served as foreign minister, and Avi Nissenkorn was the justice minister. Three of the most important portfolios. And as a result of that, especially under the, the guise of, the, of, the, of uh, the, the Avi Nissenkorn serving as justice minister, he was able to protect the integrity of the legal system, especially in the context of other people trying to interfere from outside. He, he respected the, the rule of law and gave backing and protection to the, to the judges, which I think was significant. And the second aspect in the role of foreign and defense ministers within his party, they, when it came to dealing with the Americans, even a Trump administration, they recalibrated, not just to deal directly with Netanyahu, but dealt with all three of them. And when it came to the, the plans or the, uh, the proposed plans of annexation, extension of sovereignty to parts of the West Bank, that had a real impact on Israeli policy when American senior officials came, Pompeo, Kushner, et cetera, and spoke to both not only Netanyahu, but also Ashkenazi and Gantz, and took their views into account.
So I think history may judge this term very differently, but there's no doubt that he is he is fighting for his uh, political survival now. And it seems to be by his campaign that he's looking for a sympathy vote. And I'm not convinced that Israelis, when they go to vote, really take sympathy into account um, when they went out of all their calculations. I think you made some very good points there, Richard, because I think a lot of people will view Benny Gantz as somebody that was um, uh, a good uh, chief of staff uh, of, of the Israeli army and is a decent man um, that, that maybe has just found himself outfoxed in the political uh, cloak and dagger and smoke and mirrors that is the Israeli political scene. And um, it, as you, I think you may be right that uh, history may judge him a little more fairly than possibly the electorate will next week. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So while Benny Gantz's uh, fortunes have taken a real dive, uh, the fortunes of the people he left behind, uh, who, who he split with, such as uh, Yair Lapid, um, of uh, his uh, um, uh, centrist party, have taken quite a, a rise in the uh, polls. Now, uh, I was just reading on the BICOM website your uh, latest news pieces on the site to do with the election. I've got to say, um, uh, uh, hand on heart, I think this is one of the best um, uh, sort of potted views of the way uh, things are going in Israel leading up to the elections. And I think it's a credit to BICOM that they've put this, the figures and the, the facts out there for people to take a look at and uh, decide on. Um, now, as far as the potential coalitions, because Israel has to have coalition government, uh, what do you foresee is going to happen there? Because there are so many different players in the game. How do you see things panning out? Have you got your crystal ball with you, Richard? What, what can you tell us? I was going to say, you know, they, they, there's a saying here in Israel, they say that, uh, that after the temple was destroyed, prophecy was, uh, was, was, given, to, was given to the fools. Um, so I'll be very careful about making too many predictions, but we can outline perhaps various scenarios that could play out. And I think uh, the, the first scenario, the, the simplest one to understand, perhaps, is Netanyahu's race to reach, a, to, to reach a governing majority. As we know, 120 seat chamber, the golden number to reach is 61. And because it's so close, it may come down to just those single votes. Uh, worth noting historically that governments were often formed with a, with a far healthier majority, 65, maybe sometimes into the, into the 70s. But because of the fragmented nature of the politics at the moment, 61 will be enough and they'll be told to take that to the bank. So the first scenario is that the Likud combined with the, uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties and perhaps one of the extreme right-wing parties, if they get over the threshold, will have enough to get over 61. That will be a very clear, as, as, as Netanyahu likes to say, a full-on right-wing government. And that scenario is, uh, is, is certainly a possibility. The second scenario is that it's the anti-Netanyahu camp that is able to form a majority. And there you have kind of the, the three or four large centrist, cent centre, centre-right parties um, of, uh, of the New Hope Party, of the Yamina Party, of, uh, of Israel Beitenu and Yeshatid, that may well require if Blue and White gets over as well, as well as kind of what's left of the left wing, Labour and Meret. And that combined also could reach 61. And although that kind of represents quite a broad church um, in the sense of Israeli politics, their, their shared desire to end the rule of Netanyahu could be just enough to bring them all together. And that is, uh, I suppose that is kind of a theoretical, theoretical and reasonable second scenario. In that scenario, it's actually very interesting of who would be prime minister, because mm -hmm. clearly the two right wing parties, both uh, led by Natali Bennett and Yamina and, uh, and uh, Gidon Saar of New Hope, see themselves as the viable candidates. Well, Yael Lapid, who you mentioned, is also a reasonable candidate for prime minister. But can they agree amongst themselves who actually takes it on? Yes, indeed. I think it was yesterday that Yair Lapid said, and it surprised a lot of people, that being prime minister as part of a coalition group against uh, Netanyahu wasn't essential to him. He'd be prepared to, he suggested, set his ego aside if it was for the good of the country to uh, keep Netanyahu out. That might be something that um, plays against him in the, in, in the actual polling, because people in Israel like people to be very strong in their opinions uh, as, as leaders. I, I thought I found that quite an interesting comment. I would have thought some British audiences would 
see that as being a very uh, decent thing to do. But as we've seen in Israel, sometimes you have to be very strong in your positions and only after the election start the bargaining about who's going to take um, to take the jobs. But uh, a couple of points I want to um, talk to you about. First of all, is the role of the religious parties. Um, we have uh, the, the Shas uh, um, uh, party and we have the uh, the party of the uh, Ashkenazi, uh, of, Israel, of, of the Ashkenazi uh, Orthodox Jewish parties. Now, these uh, are two parties that have already committed themselves to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, although there has been a slight um, spanner thrown in the works uh, from some in the religious parties to do with the uh, recent decision of the Supreme Court uh, about uh, who they acknowledge as being Jewish in the state of Israel. And that could set Netanyahu a problem, couldn't it? Because that's an issue that they seem to be prepared to pull out of their promise of aligning with Netanyahu for. Well, first of all, I'd say that for all the promises, and this goes across the board, one should be one should take be very sceptical and take with a pinch of salt any promises that are made in the run-up to an election two or three weeks before. People, after the results are in, can talk to a very different tune. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't take all those too seriously. Um, in terms of the loyalty, this was something that the Prime Minister Netanyahu demanded of his quote unquote natural partners to fully commit themselves beforehand. And again, in this context, they are prepared to do so. If the, the scenarios that I painted before and that Netanyahu does not have 61, then I see that they, they will have no compunction, the ultra orthodox parties, to appeal to someone like Gidon Saar, of whom they have a very close professional working relationship, and try and pivot themselves to form a government, even if, the, even if Netanyahu and the could are unable to form a government. Um, with regards to that fascinating question of who is a Jew, which has kind of uh, been in the shadows of the Israeli since Israel was created, and as you correctly say, the, uh, the Supreme Court made their rulings with regarding conversion of uh, non-Orthodox uh, um, Jewry. And the ultra-Orthodox are, are clearly, this is, this is one of their kind of uh, primo facto kind of issues that they are co most concerned about. I don't see that as a problem for Netanyahu. I think he would quite happily acquiesce um, to their demands, especially in the context that by doing so, you could write the law that would take away some of the powers of the Supreme Court, which is also beneficial to Netanyahu with regard to, to, the, to his trials and other issues about governability, which is also a popular issue amongst the Likud MKs. So I think on that, if they are able to form a government, they'll find that they're knocking on an open door. Um, and, that, and that won't necessarily be a problem, but it certainly would be a problem if they look to join a different constellation of, uh, of coalition with the, with the, with the non-Netanyahu pact. It's very interesting what you say there, Richard, because, uh, um, you know, reading between the lines, what you're saying is that uh, Netanyahu is prepared to do anything in order to keep the religious parties on side, even if that means overriding the Supreme Court and run, uh, running roughshod over a, a decision made by the Supreme Court judges. Now, for most democracies, that would be uh, a step too far. So how can we explain that to people in Britain that are looking at Israel as supposedly the only proper democracy in the Middle East, that the prime minister uh, could potentially do something of that kind? Well, listen, it, it would, this is, to an extent, already we're part of a constitutional crisis here, although, of course, Israel doesn't have a written constitution, just like the UK. So it's made up of its basic laws. And there is a constant tension, I would say here, between the branches of government, especially between the executive and the judiciary, of really where sovereignty lies. And historically, I mean, again, for, for any UK audiences may appreciate this, that the system is based on the UK system of being able to have a uh, judicial review of decisions, which kind of takes things away from Parliament. And this is the issue where over the last couple of decades, some, some judges have been, have been accused of judicial activism, which is taking away sovereignty and power from the elected chamber. So this is the context of this, of this challenge. Who has the ultimate authority? Who has the decision between the, the judges that are obviously unelected are chosen and uh, they're chosen in quite a convoluted matter, but to a large part they are, they, they are uh, peer chosen by their by within the judiciary and the and it's about the uh, both the executive and and the uh, legislative branch which are trying to pull back 
and wrestle back some of this power. Mm. It, it is a fascinating situation. And it's a situation that concerns some sectors of society who believe that um, uh, the current Prime Minister Netanyahu would uh, potentially uh, you know, be prepared to undermine the law in, in order to save his own um, uh, skin from going uh, into court and on trial for these very serious uh, corruption allegations, as well as his political career. But I don't think we should dwell too much on that because he's, he's only one of a number of players. And according to the um, statistics that you quoted um, in the uh, BICOM articles, uh, the latest predictions from Channel 13, one of the main news channels uh, in Israel, their news, suggested that actually 13 parties could potentially get enough votes to pass the minimum threshold, which means that the bargaining and the wheeler dealing and the backroom deals uh, could be something quite extraordinary. And what I want to ask you is, almost one in five people in Israel is Arab, and there are a number of Arab parties. What are the prospects of there being um, the Arab vote being in, in incorporated into any of the coalitions, be they uh, right, centre, or, or, to, or to the centre-left? Uh, as I, When I laid out the scenarios earlier, I, I deliberately left out the, the Arab parties because I think it's too much of a stretch at this point to imagine that they, the, the bandwidth of a, of a government could include right-wing parties, especially someone like Avigdor Lieberman, but even Gidon Saar and Naftali Bennett as well, alongside the, uh, alongside the joint list. But I would say that there is, we should make the distinction between the Arab parties and the Israeli Arab population, because I think there's something very fundamentally fascinating and important happening within Israeli Arab society. And I think there are, there are three aspects of where they diverge from their politicians. Um, the majority of the population want to be integrated into Israeli society. They accept all the, they, they see the benefits of, uh, of Israel, both as a, as a flawed but functioning democracy, um, the advanced technological startup nation, et cetera, and the, and the benefit that that has for, uh, for, for econ economic uh, um, uh, betterment. So I think they want part of that uh, integrated Israeli society approach. Um, they also want their politicians to have real impact and not sit on the sidelines constantly in the opposition. And thirdly, that unlike the, the joint list that were the only party to vote against the ratification of the Abraham Accords um, last November, the Israeli Arab public broadly support those, uh, those normalization agreements and understand that they have so much to gain from uh, the, the, being the bridge between Israeli society and the wider Arab world. Now, how this will affect the politics is yet to be seen. We've seen in the polls, at least, that the joint list, first of all, they've fragmented. They've lost the uh, 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 one quarter of their uh, representatives within the RAM, the United Arab List, which is the Islamist party. And most fascinating that the, that Islamist party, that faction, has actually been cooperating with the Likud party. And we can, if you're interested, we can discuss further examples of that cooperation. But in any case, the three parties that are now left in the joint list are polling basically just over half their power that they had last time. So their influence will be, will be somewhat uh, reduced. But that doesn't mean that, and that would suggest that the Israeli Arab votes are going elsewhere. Now we see that Brent, uh, Netanyahu at the same time as kind of talking about a full-on right-wing government is also on a serious charm offensive amongst the Israeli Arab population. He's placed a Muslim candidate on the Likud, Likud list for the first time ever and is really making, uh, emphasizing a lot of it in time and investment into uh, encouraging Likud support within that sector. And similarly, there are other Zionist parties, mainstream Zionist parties, that are also pivoting and trying to appeal to that Israeli Arab public in an effort to enhance their integration. So I think that, they, that there, is kind of, there are two moves here, um, but I don't really see the joint list as a political platform in necessarily part of a future government. Yeah, some very interesting points there, Richard. And um, I, I think what you say is uh, spot on. Um, Netanyahu's tactic in trying to reach out to uh, Israeli Arab voters is very, very interesting indeed, because it was uh, only a, an election or two ago, I forget which one, when he was uh, screaming that the Arabs are coming, you know, we've got to stop them getting to the, you know, otherwise we're going to lose the country. All of a sudden, he, he's saying, well, you know, I'm, uh, he did an interview with Fox News where he was telling Fox in America that, you know, he's lauded amongst the Arab um, public as uh, 
uh, Abu Ya'ir, the father of uh, Ya'ir, and all this kind of thing, which was a bit cringeworthy, but uh, he made his point. And I think with the Arab um, voters as well, while very few Jewish voters, a very, very few Jewish voters, would vote for an Arab uh, party, uh, many of the Israeli Arabs do vote uh, for different mainstream Israeli parties like the Likud, uh, like Meretz, Likud on the right, Meretz on the left, and others. So it seems that Netanyahu and other uh, is, um, Jewish uh, Israeli polit political uh, leaders are, are trying to take those votes away from the Arab parties and have Arab voters joining the, um, the mainstream of Israeli, which is uh, Israeli politics, which is a fascinating move that they're uh, trying to incorporate them much more maybe than they looked to do in the last uh, election or two. Um, I just want to uh, quickly move on because you know we're limited to time uh, to some degree with a, a look at the coronavirus situation that Israel is um, has opened up in the last few days and the lockdown has ended. I want you to give me a, a view as to how much of that ending of the lockdown is um, a political move uh, rather uh, than a, a move, um, as Boris Johnson would say, uh, dictated by the science. I think it's a balance of both. I mean, we've seen, but those of us that have followed the, the, the Israeli media coverage of this on a regular basis have seen just how politicized the, uh, the combating of coronavirus has become. There have been endless disputes between the blocks of, of, of Benny Gantz and Netanyahu in cabinet. Unprecedented times we've seen cabinet meetings go on for hours but fail to reach a, a, a meaningful decision and having these things postponed. Um, in the context of this election, it's quite clear that Netanyahu, first of all, is playing up big time the fact that it was him that brought the, uh, the vaccinations to Israel. It was his personal, his personal leadership and relationship with the, the head of Pfizer that was able, and able to bring this. And that may be true to a large extent, but certainly that's featuring very strongly um, within, within his campaign. I think you know, going back a month or two, they were very much hoping that by this stage, not only would the vaccinations have kicked in, but we wouldn't have had the uh, the variants that we've exported from imported from abroad, especially from from the UK and South Africa and, and New York, and therefore that the opening up of the economy and society generally has been stalled. I don't think, though, having said all that, that it's going to be a significant uh, um, play on, in the, in these elections. And I say that because we are in the the fourth round in, in, within within such a short pace pace of time. My sense is that most of the Israeli electorate have already priced this in and already kind of are quite decided whether all of this is Netanyahu's credit and he deserves to be lauded for it, or all this is kind of happening despite him and that he needs to go in any case. I think these, the fact that we've seen relative stability in the, in the polls over quite a, quite a period of months shows that the Israeli public is quite settled in this, and I don't think that's going to have such a significant effect on the outcome. Yeah, uh, I noted in your um, uh, web um, analysis of the election, uh, the quote that there were about 17% of people that still haven't decided who they're going to vote for. And that 17% is sure to swing it uh, one way or the other, I, I would have thought. Uh, with regard to um, the coronavirus situation, personally, I feel that if there hadn't been an election, we would have stayed locked down um, quite a little bit longer because the figure, well, the R number in some communities is already over one, which in every other democratic country has resulted in the lockdown remaining in place. And I think we could end up with, um, unfortunately, uh, more people um, becoming sick and possibly dying and uh, having to go back to another lockdown, which would uh, you know, impact economically um, quite significantly uh, on uh, 2021. But that all remains to be seen. And we're going to find out for ourselves, aren't we, Richard, in the next um, few days. I know they're trying to get people, uh, they've opened the airport up a little bit, but they're only allowing 3,000 people a day in. And the people that are overseas may not realise that unless you're a diplomat, uh, you can't vote in an Israeli election unless you're actually here uh, to vote yourself. So that also has an impact that in the past, a lot of people have flown back in to vote from wherever they've been living. And that isn't going to happen this time, is it? No, that is an interesting dynamic that we've had the, I mean, listen, it's been unprecedented because of this pandemic to have the airport closed. And again, a lot of criticism is being aired of the government. Israel is within such a, an advantageous position, effectively being a real island 
that Ben Gurion Airport is the only real um, exit and entrance points of the country, and that facing a pandemic, they really could have done a better job at closing it off or, or doing testing at the airport and making sure people were quarantined, etc. There is now, as as you as you correctly note, this kind of this rush to get the Israelis to allow allow them back in in time for the uh, for the election to allow them to. Uh, to, to have their to use their to use their vote in a in a in a meaningful sense, um, I haven't seen the statistics of how many people are trapped because I thought that the the three thousand a day would allow most of those Israelis that want to come back, given the time frame that we still have, allow them to uh, to come to come back in. Um, I think it's also worth noting that there are some very creative and interesting ways in which people that are in quarantine or are ill with the coronavirus are able to vote. They've created these, uh, these drive-through uh, drive voting stations where you can have no contact with anyone else and you pick up your slip and you vote in your car, basically. Um, another aspect that they've impl they're implementing is going to be voting booths in old age homes as well, which could have an advantage to some of the parties that appeal to uh, an, the, the older, older demographics. Yeah, absolutely. My mother-in-law will be taking advantage of the drive-through because unfortunately she's had coronavirus and I don't think she'll be uh, out and about much before um, next week, but I'm sure she'll be driving through with her slip in her hand, making sure she has uh, her voice say, like most mother-in-law, she has plenty to say about everything. Um, but Richard, it's been uh, a delight really uh, looking through the um, the background and the potential dynamics of the election next week. And it's been quite enlightening, a lot of the things that you've put before us. And um, I look forward all being well to speaking to you again. And I'd refer people as well, if they want to find out more about the work of BICOM, you have your website, don't you? And I'm sure you're available uh, across social media as well for people to see what you're doing. Of course, yeah, thank you, Paul. I'd love to, I'd love to come back and, uh, and chew over the fact when we have the results perhaps. Um, but for people that are interested, uh, www.bicom.org.uk and you can find us as Paul says on social media as well and we hope that it is a, a valuable resource for people that want to know more about Inside Israel. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you very much Richard and thanks to you for watching. Uh, we hope you found this uh, uh, explanation of uh, what's really going on in Israel as far as the uh, fourth election is concerned of some use and we'll be back with another special interview very, very soon indeed, as well as our uh, return to our second series of what the Israeli papers say, which will be coming up soon enough as well, just before uh, the election itself. But for now, from myself and Richard, uh, bye-bye and have a great weekend. Bye-bye for now.